From Creation Ministries International, you're listening to Creation.com's article podcast. The research and insights that give God the glory, refutes evolution, and gives you the answers to defend your faith. I'm Joseph Darnell. July 2022 marks the 53rd year anniversary of the first landing on the moon. In 1969, Neil Armstrong took the first steps on the moon, a major achievement of space exploration. Apollo 11 was followed by five other moon landings which led to a better understanding of the composition and geology of the moon. However, in the Darwin Bicentennial year 2009, Professor Martin Ward, who is head of physics at Durham University, made the following statement. Apart from the sheer wonder of seeing on live TV grainy images of man on the moon, many people might ask, what has the moon ever done for us? There are superficial justifications for visiting our nearest neighbor, one being that space technology saw the advent of non-sticking frying pans. However, the Apollo program also pushed forward computer technology and the miniaturization of electronics which benefit our lives today. The deepest justification for visiting the moon, though, is that many astronomers now believe that it may have played a crucial role in the evolution of life on Earth. Information gained from moon rock samples and experiments set up on the lunar surface have given us new insights into the makeup and evolution of the moon, and hence our own origins. Ward does not explain in what way the understanding of the makeup of the moon has affected evolutionary theory and the evolutionist explanation for human origins, though it is possible to guess at what he meant. But as Creation Ministries International has shown before, the moon in reality is a huge problem for evolution, and instead makes sense within a biblical framework. Evolutionists have had several theories for the moon's origin, but all of them have serious flaws. Currently, the theory that is accepted by most evolutionary astronomers, and also by the compromising progressive creationist astronomer Hugh Ross, is the impact theory. This is the idea that the moon was formed from a collision between the Earth and another object. This theory also has its problems. In order to blast enough debris to form the moon, the colliding object would have had to be at least twice as large as Mars, or debris would fall back to Earth. There is also the problem of losing angular momentum. Genesis 1, 17 through 18 says that the sun and the moon were created to, quote, give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness, end quote. So one of the important functions of the moon is to light the world at night. Many of the world's cultures, including the ancient Jews, used a lunar calendar that used the phases of the moon to mark the passage of time, so there was also an important timekeeping function. We now know that the moon also plays a crucial role to life on Earth. The pull of its gravity causes the tides in Earth's oceans, which cleanse the shorelines and keeps the ocean's current circulating. Without this force, eventually the oceans would stagnate, and friction caused by the tides is gradually slowing the Earth's rotation and lengthening the days by 0.002 seconds per century. The momentum lost by the Earth is gained by the Moon, causing it to recede from the Earth by about 2 centimeters per year, and it would have receded at a faster rate in the past. We know that the Moon could not have been closer than 18,400 kilometers from the Earth to begin with, or Earth's tidal forces would have shattered it. This gives us a maximum possible age for the moon of 1.37 billion years, far less than what evolution would require. Of course, this does not mean that the moon is that old, because the moon did not necessarily start out as close as possible to the Earth. Another argument for design involves the angular size of the sun and moon. The moon is 400 times smaller than the sun, but it is also 400 times closer to Earth. This makes them look the same size from Earth, they both take up approximately half of one degree in the sky. If this were not the case, complete solar eclipses would not be possible. Without solar eclipses, it would be difficult to gain information about the chromosphere, a part of the sun's atmosphere which is outshined by the photosphere, except briefly at the beginning and end of a complete solar eclipse, as well as other solar phenomena. Contrary to Ward's assertion, 
The moon gives us several pieces of evidence for the recent creation and intelligent design of the universe, and only raises questions for the evolutionist astronomers who have yet to propose a plausible account for its origin by naturalistic means. So, how about the moon landings? The question I'm guessing all of you want us to answer is, was the Apollo 11 moon landing a hoax? We'll answer that right after the break. Did you know that at creation.com we have several books and videos that can further your understanding of creationism and the issues that Christians are confronted with at church? A great example of our resources you can purchase is the Classic Refuting Pack. It's three books that do an excellent job responding to Christian evolutionary compromises. The first book in the pack is Refuting Evolution, a hard-heading critique of the most up-to-date arguments for evolution to challenge educators, students, and parents. It is a powerful yet concise summary of the arguments against evolution and for creation, and it helps students and teachers think more critically about origins. This top-selling book has over 450,000 copies in print. The second book in the pack, Refuting Evolution 2, is a sequel to Refuting Evolution that comprehensively refutes arguments to support evolution, as presented in TV documentaries and Scientific American. Read world-leading evolutionists in their own words, and then find straightforward answers from science and the Bible. Refuting Evolution 2 will prepare you to answer the best arguments thrown at you by peers, teachers, neighbors, and skeptics. And the third book of the classic pack is Refuting Compromise, a comprehensive and resounding refutation of the position of progressive creationist Hugh Ross, whose views cause massive confusion about science and the Bible. Refuting Compromise is one of the most powerful and scientific defenses of a straightforward view of Genesis creation ever written. So get this pack of three excellent books at creation.com store. So the moment you've all been waiting for. According to a recent Telegraph article, one-fourth of British people surveyed believed the Apollo 11 moon landing never actually happened. Various conspiracy theorists give reasons why they believe the moon landings were faked. They accuse NASA of staging the landing and cite what looks like wind moving the flag in the absence of stars in the photos as evidence for their theory. Experts counter that what looks like wind is the result of the astronauts handling the flexible aluminum flag pole, which continued to vibrate after they let go of the flag giving the appearance of wind. And the stars were not visible due to the rapid exposure time of the cameras, necessary to produce sufficient detail in the photographs. But skeptics also argue that the moon rocks are identical to those in Antarctica. But geologists counter that the moon rocks found on Earth are scorched by their entry into Earth's atmosphere, while the rocks brought back by the Apollo 11 crew lack the scorching, meaning that they must have been brought back to Earth by humans. Hmm. Now, the main claims are debunked on our Don't Use page, the seventh most accessed page on creation.com. It is popular to accuse the government of hiding the truth. But to go 40 years without one leak from inside about the true nature of the landing would be an incredible achievement, one that deserves the public's skepticism for the simple reason that no government is intelligent enough to pull off such an elaborate cover-up. It is interesting that often self-proclaimed skeptics are the most susceptible to these conspiracy theories. But there is no reason to doubt the official story of the Apollo 11 landing. Especially as a creationist, James Irwin landed on the moon in a later Apollo mission, and newer photos of the moon taken by NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter definitely put these theories to rest. The photos show the landing sites for five of the six Apollo landings, with the remaining Apollo 12 landing site remaining to be photographed. This episode of the Creation.com Article Podcast was written by Lita Sanders and was produced out of the U.S. studio of Creation Ministries International. Our speakers and scientists host another show called Creation.com Talk, which you can find at our YouTube channel or your preferred audio podcast app. To learn more about our ministry, visit Creation.com and get in touch if you want to arrange to have one of our creationist speakers visit your church. If you'd like to help out CMI, become a monthly supporter at Creation.com donate 
You can also help by telling your friends to check us out on Facebook and Instagram, or subscribe to our free e-newsletter. If you want to get the latest creation research, subscribe to Creation Magazine. I'm your host, Joseph Darnell, and from everyone at creation.com, thanks for listening.